नमस्कार वॉम वेलकम टू वर्ल्ड न्यूज एंड इंडियन परस्पेक्टिव ऑन ऑल इंडिया रेडियो दिस इज आर एस रघु एंड विद मी इज पूर्णिमा सावंत कड़ाकोटी ब्रिंगिंग ग्लिम्सेस ऑफ द मेजर डेवलपमेंट्स ऑफ द डे फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द ग्लोब ओवर द नेक्स्ट हाफ एन आवर वी शैल ब्रिंग यू द लेटेस्ट फ्रॉम द वर्ल्ड ऑफ पॉलिटिक्स इकोनॉमी स्पोर्ट्स एंटरटेनमेंट एंड मोर दी हेडलाइंस New Delhi gives ex post facto approval for MOU between India and Bangladesh on withdrawal of up to 153 cusex of water each from common border river Kushiara. Indian fertilizer companies sign MOU with Canadian firm Canpotex to maintain supply of potassium fertilizer to the country. India is the first country with a cooling action plan says environment minister Bhupendra Yadav. addresses world green economy summit in dubai government appoints lieutenant general anil chauhan retired as next chief of defense staff un condemns violent crackdown by iranian security forces on women protesters in iran and in cricket in the first t20 international india beat south africa by 8 wickets in tiruvananthapuram The Union Cabinet today has given its ex post facto approval for a memorandum of understanding MOU between India and Bangladesh on withdrawal of up to 153 cusex of water each by them from common border river Kushiara. This MOU will enable Assam government to withdraw up to 153 cusex of water from the common stretch of Kushiara river during dry season that is 1st of November to 31st of May for their water requirement. A joint monitoring team will be set up by both the countries to monitor the withdrawal of water by each side during dry season. This MOU was signed on the 6th of this month. The Union Cabinet has also extended the Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan Anna Yojana PMGKAY scheme for another 3 months from October to December this year. Briefing reporters after the cabinet meeting in New Delhi Information and Broadcasting Minister Anurag Thakur said that 44762 crore rupees will be spent over the next 3 months He said the government has spent approximately 3 lakh 45000 crore rupees so far under the scheme Mr Thakur said the scheme covers nearly 80 crore beneficiaries across the country and it has been under implementation since April 2020 The government has also approved Indian Railways proposal for redevelopment of three major railway stations these are New Delhi railway station Ahmedabad and Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj terminus Mumbai the project involves an investment of approximately 10000 crore rupees briefing reporters about the cabinet decisions in New Delhi railways minister Ashwani Vaishnav said the redevelopment work of three railway stations will be completed in 2 to 3 years The minister said the redevelopment work of 199 railway station is going on across the country. Prime Minister Narendra Modi has said that today's cabinet decision to extend the Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan Anna Yojana will benefit crores of people across India and ensure support during this festive season. In a tweet Mr Modi said India's infrastructure has to be futuristic and today's cabinet decision on redevelopment of New Delhi Ahmedabad and Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj terminus reflects this vision of the government he said these stations will be modernized and further ease of living Indian fertilizer companies have signed an MOU with Canpotex Canada one of the largest potash suppliers globally the Indian companies are Coromandel International Chambal Fertilizers and Indian Potash Limited Chemicals and Fertilizers Minister Dr Mansukh Mandviya said the MOU will reduce both supply and price volatility and ensure stable long term supply of potassium fertilizer to India he said the Canpotex company will supply up to 15 lakh tons of potash and willy for a period of 3 years to the indian fertilizer companies he said this supply partnership is expected to improve the fertilizer availability within the country and reduce supply side and price vulnerabilities the minister said government has been encouraging the domestic fertilizer industry for establishing supply linkages through long term partnerships with resource rich nations These partnerships will provide secured availability of fertilizers and raw materials over a period of time and also offer price stability in volatile market conditions. 
Environment, Forest and Climate Change Minister Bhupinder Yadav has said that India is the first country with a cooling action plan based on energy efficiency and thermal comfort and has launched important initiatives including Ujjala Yojana and schemes for industrial energy efficiency. Addressing the Ministerial Roundtable for Green Economy at the World Green Economy Summit at the World Trade Center in Dubai today, Bhupinder Yadav said, accelerating low-carbon transition across different economic sectors is the need of the hour. He also stressed the importance of addressing environmental and climate objectives alongside economic development. After the roundtable, the minister also had a bilateral meeting with the United Arab Emirates, UAE, Minister of State for Foreign Trade, Dr. Thani bin Ahmad al Ziyodi. In the meeting, both the leaders discussed issues relating to the upcoming conference of parties, COP27, COP28, MOU, on climate actions between India and UAE and global initiatives spearheaded by these countries for combating climate change. The government today appointed Lieutenant General Anil Chauhan retired as the next Chief of Defence Staff CDS. Lieutenant General Johan will also function as Secretary, Department of Military Affairs, with effect from the date of his assumption of charge. In a career spanning nearly 40 years, Lieutenant General Anil Johan had held several command, staff and instrumental appointments and had extensive experience in counter-insurgency operations in Jammu and Kashmir and Northeast India. The post of Chief of Defence Staff has been lying vacant since General Bipin Rawat's death in a helicopter crash on the 8th of December last year. Born on 18th May 1961, Lieutenant General Anil Chauhan was commissioned into the 11 Gorkha Rifles of the Indian Army in 1981. He is an alumnus of the National Defence Academy, Khadak Vasla, and Indian Military Academy, Dehradun. In the rank of Major General, the officer had commanded an infantry division in the critical Baramula sector in the Northern Command. Later, as Lieutenant General, he commanded a corps in the Northeast and subsequently went on to become the General Officer Commanding-in-Chief of the Eastern Command, from September 2019 and held the charge until he retired from the service in May 2021. In addition to these command appointments, Lieutenant General Chauhan also tenanted important staff appointments including the charge of Director General of Military Operations. Earlier, he had also served on a United Nations mission to Angola. For his distinguished and illustrious service in the Army, Lieutenant General Anil Chauhan retired, was awarded the Param Vishisht Seva Medal, Uttam Yudh Seva Medal, Ati Vishisht Seva Medal, Sena Medal and and wishes to save a medal. This is Saira Mushtaba, News Desk. This is All India Radio giving you the world news. For quick news updates round the clock, follow us on Twitter at AIR News Alerts. The central government has declared Popular Front of India, PFI, and its associates and affiliates as an unlawful association with immediate effect for a period of five years. In its notification, Union Home Ministry said the PFI and its associates and affiliates, including Rehab India Foundation, Campus Front of India, All India Imams Council, National Confederation of Human Rights Organization, National Women's Front, Junior Front, Empower India Foundation and Rehab Foundation, Kerala have been involved in the violent terrorist activities with an intent to create a reign of terror in the country. It added that the government is of the opinion that if there is no immediate curb of unlaw unlawful activities of the PFI and related fronts, they will use this opportunity to continue its survival activities, thereby disturbing public order and undermining the constitutional setup of the country. In today's hot pot section, we bring you a discussion on crackdown on anti-national outfits, ban on popular front of India. In conversation are Arun Bhagat, former director, intelligence bureau, and Ram Namrata Biji, a huja journalist. The ban on the Popular Front of India wasn't a sudden decision. It was preceded by raid, arrest of multiple PFI leaders, their cadres, and collection of evidence, which was very crucial before the ban could come in. This seemed to be a very well thought out and planned strategy and operation by intelligence and investigating agencies, where the government 
chipped in by getting the Muslim organizations on board, by consulting with them to denounce the extremist ideology, and also creating an atmosphere where the entire country could come together to be able to support the ban. What are your thoughts on this, sir? This uh, PFI is a very old organization. It was set up in 2004 by three fundamentalist Islamic organizations combining together in South India. And after that, they started increasing their spread and very quickly they spread to virtually all over India. Their motivation was that they wanted to establish an Islamic government. They also started getting a lot of uh, aid and money from abroad and also developed some connections with fundamentalist organizations, Islamic organizations abroad. They tried to emulate and they have been praising Muslim Brotherhood organization. As a matter of fact, they Muslim Brotherhood organization was uh, banned and in Egypt they ha had a special day and programs organized for that. Also some connections have been found with the ISIS as well as the Al-Qaeda. So the right from the very beginning, they had very intentions were very, very bad, and they started indulging in various criminal activities, whether it was bombing, whether it was use of explosives, some murders have been committed by their carders, and 1,400 is the number, roughly, PFI carders who have been arrested. So the government had to take some decision. They could not allow this organization to continue to spread and to motivate people, mislead their community. As a matter of fact, they had very aggressive demonstrations, complete with people dressed up in uniform and uh, carrying bamboo sticks and, and having many programs were held all over the country for training their carders. The government had to take a decision, and I think it is the right time that they did. Hopefully, there will be a lot of evidence which they have collected because it was also done very secretly and I don't think there was any indication to anybody that this effort would be made, this raids would be conducted in so many states simultaneously. About 450 of their functionaries, senior functionaries and leaders have been arrested and a lot of documents as well as electronic equipment has been seized. So hopefully there will be a lot of evidence and the tribunal will also be satisfied and will reaffirm the decision of the government to ban this organization and suspend it for five years. The fact is that a large part of the PFI cadres, particularly their top leadership, comes from the SIMI, the Students Islamic Movement of India, which was banned in 2001. The fact that a lot of these SIMI cadres, soon after the ban on SIMI, switched over to organizations like the PF, PFI and began their activities in another form, changing color, just the way multiple terror organizations do the moment they are banned. How do you see this whole crackdown again? clamping heavily down on outfits like the Simi, which have made inroads not just in PFI, but the, the radicalization and the kind of extremism is rampant across. There is always an apprehension that some other organizations will come up. But uh, in this case, there are about eight associated uh, organizations of the PFI, which have been also been banned. So I think that uh, this is very good uh, operation which has been conducted and the sheer scale of it has been uh, shows that there was a lot of planning and organization and at the same they were able to maintain the secrecy. Fortunately, now we have been able to develop channels of information coming in from abroad, various agencies. As a matter of fact, the United Nations is also taking a lot of interest in this. With this uh, feedback coming in, particularly the money part if is stopped, foreign money coming in for these organizations, then we will have a major a success. Roadwork seems to have been done by the Enforcement Directorate in this direction, uh, where before the ban and the raids, a lot of their accounts were seized. The kind of money laundering network they had formed with their own uh, operators in Gulf countries had been exposed and presented before the government. So in that sense, how do you see 
simultaneously cracking down on the and you know choking the funds of an organization like this is much more important than just clamping down with penal provisions there has to be a multiple approach apart from identification of these people identification of their centers identification of where they are meeting and gaining information about what they are planning to do what uh, type of propaganda they are continuing finance is a very important element and uh, if uh, we are successful in uh, preventing funds coming into them and also preventing people from contributing to these so called causes which their propaganda and their fundamentalist ideas which they propound i think that will be a very positive factor but at the same time one has to realize that uh, the islamist radical groups are very large number and they are very very active and every time we have to be very careful about it it's been a shocking misleading of you know the muslim community the the tfi trying to portray itself as a charitable organization working for the downtrodden and then to have bogus receipts bogus funding and kind of it creates a disenchantment amongst the section of a large population where they feel cheated by somebody who was trying to project themselves as the messiah taking a community forward how do you think the pfi has really let down its people who were looking for genuine help a, a genuine charitable organization for that matter you see here we have educated our own masses also the people themselves have to realize and i think there is a movement it may be very slight it may be very early but some movement has started in the community itself to rethink whether they should go by the fundamentalist ideologies which have been going around in the past and which i would say were freely being propounded now that thinking in the community is very very necessary and i think uh, the government in this different states as well as center they have to pay attention to this and some steps which are being taken like in up making the madrasas the curriculum of the madrasas broad based and uh, contemporary rather than restricting them to religious doctrination and uh, teaching i think this is something which has to be done the such like areas have to be identified whether they are the madrasas or their religious uh, places and i think uh, if we make an effort we will be able to convince the people that uh, what is being practiced by some of them is entirely wrong they must not fall or become a prey to them the psi is also fueling the anti citizenship amendment act protests in the country the hathras so the kind of fueling of protests across the country raising issues of human rights violations where they were not was a kind of a strategy that the psi was employing across the country to disturb communal harmony and create public unrest how do you see the psi's role in these activities you know that apart from this not only where the citizens this particular act that you referred to not only there but also the hijab movement Uh, there are uh, very i mean there's a lot of evidence to show that the pfi has been one of the sponsors of this movement how do you see the tenure of the upa in handling the pfi and and vis-a-vis what we see now uh, do you think it required political will and consultations with states or just a decision that had to be taken you see this is very unfortunate aspect this is unfortunate truth that political sort of ideas intervene the security of the nation the security and welfare peace and harmony becomes uh, no action is taken now this is i think uh, something which has to be corrected and everybody should realize that the security of the nation is foremost and it is of the greatest importance and no political party thinking or ideology should be above this and uh, that i am sure also will come forth in our own country but uh, maybe not immediately and it will take a lot of time thank you thank, thank you, you. The UN has condemned the violent crackdown by Iranian security forces on the protesters angered after the death of a young woman Mahsa Amini. 
The UN Human Rights Office spokesperson Ravina Sham Dasani said the organization is extremely concerned by the apparent unnecessary and disproportionate use of force against protesters. Ms. Sham Dasani said because of restrictions on telecommunications it is difficult to get a precise number of protesters who have been killed, wounded and arrested by Iran's security forces. The state media has put the number of deaths at 41. Protests across 15 Iranian provinces erupted following the death of 22-year-old Mahsa Amini while in police custody. She was arrested by the Morality Police for allegedly not wearing the hijab properly. In Bangladesh, the death toll from a boat accident rose to 67 today. After rescue teams retrieved more than a dozen bodies, Police officials said more people are still missing and rescue operations will continue tomorrow. The boat was carrying devotees to take part in the Mahalaya festival at the Badeshwari temple in Panchagad when it lost balance midstream and capsized. The incident took place at Olia Ghat in Boda Upazila of Maria Union on Sunday afternoon. Some of the people on board the trawler were able to swim to safety. The district administration has given Taka 20,000 each to the family of the deceased and taka 10,000 each to the injured person district administration has formed a five member committee to investigate the incident and submit its report within 3 working days railways minister nurul islam sujan state minister for religious affairs faridul haq khan and the local members of parliament visited the site of the accident president m abdul hamid and prime minister sheikh hasina have expressed shock at the incident and offered condolences to the families of the deceased in ukraine the donetsk and lugansk along with kherson region and part of zaporozhye region in southern ukraine have voted to join russia in referendums that were held between september 23rd and 27th The election officials said 99% of ballots cast in Donetsk and 98% in the Luhansk region voted in favor of joining the Russian Federation. They said in the Zaporozhye region 93% were in favor of annexation with the Kherson region giving the lowest pro annexation tally at 87%. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky condemned the referendums in the four regions. The US and NATO have also condemned referendums in eastern Ukraine as voting concluded. US Secretary of State Antony Blinken said the West would never recognize the pro-annexation vote. He said the US will impose additional swift and severe costs on Russia for holding the referendums. Afghanistan's Deputy Foreign Minister for Political Affairs Sher Mohammad Abbas Tanzai has called on Pakistan to stop interfering in the internal issues of his country referring to remarks by Pakistan Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif claiming the presence of terrorist groups in Afghanistan Tanzai said that the Islamic Emirate denies and condemns the claims he said that Taliban will not allow anyone to make such statements towards Afghanistan Mr. Stengsai said that Taliban strongly condemns the Pakistan Prime Minister's statement. He further said Pakistan has financial problem and is placed on a blacklist of the international monetary funding. No one takes their call to give them money. The minister said that Pakistan should not defame Afghanistan just to earn some money. In Saudi Arabia, King Salman bin Abdul Aziz named his son and heir Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman as the Prime Minister of the Kingdom according to a royal decree showed on Tuesday King Salman also promoted his second son Prince Khalid from Deputy Defence Minister to Defence Minister the 86 year old king will still preside over the cabinet meetings he attends the king who took power in 2015 has been failing health and was hospitalized several times in recent years the prince Mohammed bin Salman was previously defense minister in Saudi Arabia's government. He is also leading figure in the kingdom's Vision 2030 plans to transform the country's economy and energy infrastructure. Mr. Salman has also sought to tout social reforms such as allowing women to drive cars with some conditions. In Cuba, electrical grid collapsed late last night leaving the entire country completely without power after hurricane Ian pummeled the western end of the island 
The head of the Electrical Energy Authority of Cuba said that the electrical system is experiencing total collapse after one of the main power plants could not be brought back online. Two people were also reported dead and buildings were damaged nationwide. The U.S. National Hurricane Center, NHC, said the Category 3 hurricane was barreling north towards the dry tortugas of the Florida Keys late on Tuesday, with maximum sustained winds of 195 kilometers per hour. According to media reports, the hurricane hit Cuba at the time of dire economic crisis. Blackouts and long-running shortages of food, medicine and fuel are likely to complicate efforts to recover from Ian. World Rabies Day is being observed today. This year's theme is Rabies, One Health, Zero Death, which marks the 16th World Rabies Day. This theme highlights the connection of the environment with both people and animals. Global Strategic Plan for the Elimination of Dog-Mediated Human Rabies Deaths by 2030 is an ambitious document with achievable targets. International Right to Know Day is being observed today. The day is being observed since 2002 when freedom of information organizations from around the world came together in Sofia, Bulgaria. The group created the Freedom of Information Advocates Network. It is a global coalition working together to promote the right of access to information for all people and the benefits of open, transparent and accountable governments. Members of the network decided to commemorate September 28th as a day as a way to share ideas, strategies and success stories about the development of freedom of information laws and genuinely transparent governance in their own nations. In cricket, India beat South Africa by eight wickets in the first T20 international at the Greenfield International Stadium, Thiruvananthapuram, tonight. Chasing a target of 107 runs, KL Rahul and Surya Kumar Yadav smashed unbeaten 50s to help achieve the target. Surya Kumar Yadav, unbeaten 50, provided India with some much-needed impetus in the chase after a shaky start. The second T20 international will be played at Bar Sapara Cricket Stadium in Guwahati on Sunday on the 2nd of October. And now a report from the business desk. Sensex declined by 510 points, a 0.89 percent, to finish at 56,598. Nifty also plunged by 150 points, a 0.87 percent, to end at 16,859. At the global stock markets, Asian markets slid as surging borrowing costs affect fears of a global recession, spooking investors into the arms of the safe haven dollar, and driving the Chinese yuan to record lows. Hong Kong's Hang Seng plunged 3.4 percent, and South Korea's Kospi declined by 2.45 percent. China, Shanghai. Composite index lost 1.6 percent. Japan's Nikkei 225 declined half a percent. European shares too fell in intraday trade. Global crude prices were broadly stable as pressure from a strengthening dollar and crude storage bills was offset by U.S. production cuts caused by Hurricane Ian. Brent crude was trading at $86.50 per barrel. And in the foreign exchange market, the rupee weakened by 36 pesos against the U.S. dollar. The domestic currency closed at 81 rupees and 94 pesos against the American Union. Arjun Chaudhary for World News, All India Radio. Now let us take a look at the major developments around the world as reported in the foreign press. The New York Times writes that trust takes a bold economic gamble, it will sink her government. Wall Street Journal reports that Bank of England to buy bonds in bid to stop spread of crisis. Washington Post reports that Kiev slams staged Russia staged referendum as propaganda show vows retribution. The Guardian writes that lift this country up, trans pioneer Erika Hilton seeks Brazil election win. South China Morning Post report says U.S. vows big dollar help for Pacific Islands as it seeks to counter China's influence. The Financial Times observes that sabotage of gas pipelines is a wake-up call for Europe. Officials warn. The Japan Times says Japan's businesses brace for long-awaited return of tourists. Now a quick look at the headlines once again. New Delhi gives ex post facto approval for MOU between India and Bangladesh on withdrawal of up to 153 cusacks of water each from common border river Kushiara. Indian fertilizer companies sign MOU with Canadian firm Canpotex to maintain supply of potassium fertilizer to the country. India is the first country with a cooling action plan, says Environment Minister Bhupendra Yadav addresses World Green Economy Summit in Dubai. Government appoints Lieutenant General Anil Chauhan retired as the next Chief of Defence Staff. 
യു എൻ കണ്ടാൻസ് വയലന്റ് ക്രാക്ക് ഡൌൺ ബൈ ഇറാനിയൻ സെക്യൂരിറ്റി ഫോഴ്സസ് ഓൺ വിമൻ പ്രൊട്ടസ്റ്റേഴ്സ് ഇൻ ഇറാൻ ആൻഡ് ഇൻ ക്രിക്കറ്റ് ഇൻ ദ ഫസ്റ്റ് ടി ട്വന്റി ഇന്റർനാഷണൽ ഇന്ത്യ ബീറ്റ് സൌത്ത് ആഫ്രിക്ക ബൈ എയ്റ്റ് വിക്കറ്റ്സ് ഇൻ തിരുവനന്തപുരം ആൻഡ് വിത്ത് ദാറ്റ് വി എൻഡ് ദിസ് ബുലറ്റിൻ വിൽ ബി ബാക്ക് അറ്റ് ദ സെയിം ടൈം ടുമോറോ വിത്ത് ദ നെക്സ്റ്റ് എഡിഷൻ ഓഫ് വേൾഡ് ന്യൂസ് Thank you.